Thanks, Paul. When, um, when Paul asked me to come and present today, he said, you're going to have to present after lunch to a really, really cynical audience because they don't believe in analytics and social. So I've got half an hour or so to convince you why you should. So I've been in IBM only seven weeks now, and uh, I've spent 12 years in startups. The last five years or so have been in social media analytics and influence. So when we were talking this morning about influence, that was something very close to my heart. I have actually become an influence, and we'll, an influence. we'll talk about it a bit later. So I know firsthand what it's like to have a brand interact with you uh, and what, what actually happens. And when I asked before, you know, I go into a meeting room and ask how many people have actually met a blogger, the reason I blog for nine years is it's a hobby and also I want to use these sort of tools. Uh, so I've been on Twitter since 2007. I've been on LinkedIn since 2004, trying all these things out. So what I'm talking about today, some of it's stuff that IBM have done, some of it's stuff that I've done personally and really, you know, seen how it worked. So I was with um, Cred for two years. We set up Cred from scratch. Cred competes with Clout. Anyone, everyone heard of Clout? Most people, Cred was the competitor. Funny story, in San Francisco, the two companies are literally next door to each other. If we go like that, they can hear us. And we changed our Wi-Fi to Cred's the best just to keep them on their toes. <clears throat> but this whole notion of influence and scoring is something that keeps brands awake at night because, yes, you can game systems. We had a discussion at lunch about how you can game these, these systems. And in fact, you can game bestseller lists. I'm sure you can game top 10 lists. Uh, back in March, the Wall Street Journal uh, looked at how the New York Times bestseller list can be gamed. If you're an author and you've got a book out tomorrow, what you do is you get all of your friends to buy lots of copies. You then return them next week, but you keep the bestseller title. And in this expose, one of the people that the author called out actually came clean and said, yeah, we did that. And actually, to their credit, blogged about how they're actually able to um, do that. Uh, so what Cred's useful for, and this is not a pitch for Cred because I don't work there anymore, but it really allows you as a brand to look at what your brand looks like online. This is my Cred page. It shows what my Cred score is, where I have influence. But more importantly, it shows what's the content that I'm sharing and what's resonating. So as a brand or as a label or as an artist, you can say, I've just tweeted about my new record. Are people retweeting that? Are people uh, talking about that, that new release? So social can be a very real-time metric on whether my album, my movie, my whatever is actually resonating and people care about it. Um, a few years ago when Twitter wasn't around, what did we do? We, we did market research and we waited for the overnights to come in and we waited for the um, top 10, top 20 hit parade to be, to be collated. So we had a delay there, whereas now it's, it's kind of real time, which is a, both a blessing and a curse for brands. But let me start with something very pragmatic. I'm Australian, so I like to tell it how it is. And I always use this slide whenever I'm talking about social stuff. And I try and dumb it down a bit because social media is just like real life. We're all having a discussion over lunch. Some of us were having a discussion, two of us were chatting, a third person came up. Only when that third person had something of value to say did we let them into the conversation. Now, I've done this at various functions deliberately, gone up to a group of two people that know each other and waited to see how long it is until I get involved in the conversation. Once it was seven minutes, I must have been really boring, or they were. And once someone said, I've just been to Brisbane, to which I said, oh, I'm from Australia, what, which city did you go to, you know, which thing did you go to? So the value there is, though, that as brands, we think, well, we've got a new release, we've got a new bit of news, we just want to send it out there and have them see it, and we'll just put it out through the social channels. That doesn't work anymore. We're talking about a conversation. Brands have to have something of value to say to be involved in that conversation. And when we're talking about music or movies, that is the biggest community in the world. Because social media is about real life, it's about communities, about what people love and they care about. And so when we're talking about my style of music, I like acid jazz, for example. Now, not everyone in the room would like acid jazz, but I guarantee if, hands up, who likes acid jazz? You'll be my friends. We'll go over to this side of the room. We'll have a chat about that. Something that's actually in common. So whether it's music or football or sport, TV shows, you've got these fanatical fans, and so that's what you can harness. And social media actually rises that all, bubbles it all to the surface, so you can actually find these people that are like-minded. Whenever I speak, this is the one thing that people write down. I made it up a couple of years ago, and it seems to resonate. Social media is the best piece of market research you never commissioned. And our friend from GSK over there, Colin, I'm not sure whether you believe this or not, but I kind of liken social media to research or market research. In fact, often when I'm in a, a brand talking about what I do, I don't lead with the social angle because often they'll say, oh, the social media guys are three doors down on the right. 
but if you want insights and you want research, yes, social media is raw, it's real time, it's unstructured, but it can be your best friend if you use it properly. So I think it is the best piece of market research you never commission. It can tell you so much more. The world today is changing. Um, when I did my university degree, there was no Twitter, Facebook. There was no two-way communication. There was no big data. In fact, Sir Richard said before he's going to vomit if he hears the word big data once more. So we'll just call it impressive data, shall we? Um, you've got big data, social, mobile, cloud, analytics. It's all just taking off. And part of the challenge for you as marketers and, and labels and, and people that represent artists is how do, you, how do you cope with all this? When I was at CRED, we had access to the full Twitter firehose, which is every single tweet in real time. So over the five-year period we had it, we collected 250 billion tweets. Now, I said that to someone the other day. They said, that's not big data. That's, that's medium-sized data. I think 250 billion of anything is a lot. The challenge is, what do you then do with that? How do you segment it? How do you get things out of that that actually provide value and make, make sense of it all? And one of my sort of poster children or adults, as the case may be, is Angela Ahrens from, C from Burberry, who said, I think last year actually, consumer data will be the biggest differentiator in the next two to three years. Whoever unlocks the reams of data and uses it strategically will win. Now, Burberry has done very well. In fact, last quarter, they were 18% up in profits. I'm sure anyone in this room would love to be 18% up for anything. But what they did is they had it driven around a digital strategy. So what the, uh, the um, press release actually said was that uh, growth was uh, driven by the strong performance of the spring-summer fashion, facilitated by the investment in digital, reflecting changing consumer behavior. Footfall was soft, but grew strongly online. Now, Angela is really smart because she said, I don't have all the answers. But most of my staff and most of my customers are around 30 years of age. They're doing this new social stuff. Why don't we ask them? So she set up a digital council inside the organization with her 30-somethings and then had an executive council to execute on that. So she was saying, I don't have all the answers. Let's actually ask people in our organization. And sometimes we kind of miss a trick. We go, well, we think we know all the answers, but you know, the people that are buying this music, what do they think? Use them as a research. We don't need to have a marketing lesson, even though we're in the business school, about the sales funnel, the marketing funnel, but you remember what it looks like. What I want to show you is some work that McKinsey did way back in 2009, where they said the marketing funnel is now a marketing loop. And we all know what it looks like, awareness, familiarity, consideration, driving people to, to make a purchase. But I want to introduce you to the consumer of the future. Her name is Madeline Grill, and she's my beautiful seven-year-old daughter. Now, this picture here, <clears throat> is actually her at our local Starbucks after swimming on a Saturday. My treat was a couple of Starbucks. Her treat was playing with the iPad. I looked across at her, and what she's doing here, she's looking at the reviews of a game called Dream Pet House. And I looked across and said, Darling, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking at the reviews, Daddy. They're really good. We should get this game. I said, why are you looking at the reviews? Well, when Mummy goes on Amazon and buys things, she looks at the reviews to see if it's any good, and this is really good. We should get it. <laughs> and it struck me that here is a seven-year-old who has never met the people that is recommending this game, and she's making a purchase decision based on someone else. And I thought, wow, this is what the millennials and I think she's Gen Z or something, or Gen A1, this is what they're going to be doing because I no longer read ads. I'm in marketing. I know how it works. I know the science of marketing. I know how you want me to buy something. When I buy a pain purchase, new car, new phone, change jobs, I want to ask someone else who's had that experience. Now, in music and movies, it can be similar. What do you think of that latest record? If we all like acid jazz, what do you think of the, the Jimmy Rakuai thing that's coming out? Do you like that? Yeah, it's really cool. You should go and buy it. Okay, I'll go and buy it. No advertising there. It's a personal recommendation. And this is where social and influence can come in. So what McKinsey said way back in 2009, which is still very valid, is that it's now a loyalty loop. And this is also relevant today as if it ever was. <clears throat> what they also said was the consideration set is actually smaller now. There is so much choice that consumers have, they actually reduce their consideration set. The evaluation phase here, though, is where social comes into its own. It's me going out there looking at reviews or looking at YouTube comments or asking my friends on Twitter or Facebook, what do you think of this new XYZ? What you want to do is get them in there and they become loyal fans and they never leave. And that can be very true with music or movies or all sorts of things where there is a community element and like-minded people are saying this is a fantastic artist or film. So I'll talk more practically now about how social can augment existing data and actually make decisions. And so this is work some, I, some work that IBM has done. But looking at what the disruptive forces are, some of the stuff we know, technology, okay? 
I've been multitasking the whole time. Very rudely, I've been on my laptop while the speakers have been speaking, but I've listened to everything. I've been catching up on my tweets and everything else. I multitask. It's what I've learned to do. Time and place shifting. I rarely watch live television. I watch catch-up TV because it suits me, and, and many of you are in the same here as well. The data is exploding. We know that. Everything that we uh, do now can be tracked. The consumer power, as I said before, the great thing about social media is that it gives consumers power. The worst thing is that it also gives consumers power. They can talk back at you. They can can a movie. They can can an album in a few tweets because they didn't think it was any good. Revenue model uncertainty, emerging markets, all of this is impacting your businesses. And there's a great quote here from Anne Sweeney, who's the president of Disney ABC, who said, our global audience will grow by 40 million by the end of this year to 3.7 billion people, or roughly half of the world's current population. Digital technology didn't disrupt our business, it transformed it. Digital didn't weaken the power of television, it unleashed it. Same with all the other things that have come before it. Newspapers didn't kill television, cinema didn't kill, you know how the story ends. So the, the kind of the, 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 where it's going now is that you know, consumers watch 50% of daily uh, video, the influence is coming into it, McKinsey saying that social is now worth 1.3 trillion. I think this last line is really powerful. Consumer insight capability equals critical enabler. Knowing more about your customers. Use existing market research, using social as a proxy, because you've got these tribes, these communities that are actually willing to talk about something. I mean, market research has always been before going out and asking someone what they think. Now people are telling you, agreed it's unstructured, you can't ask the same questions. And I've spent many times in some of your competitors face palming because they're asking me traditional market research questions and not getting that social is a bit different. I think they will. I'm sure GFK is doing well there as well. So let's talk a bit about movies. I know a lot of you in the room are in the music industry, but I think movies are a good proxy. And I actually have some data from IBM to back it up. So let's talk about movies. So what happens with the movie marketing? 12 weeks out, you do a teaser and trailers. Eight weeks out, you do a theatrical cross-promotion. The TV kicks in at four weeks, PR at two weeks. And then that opening weekend, and you hope and you pray that people like the movie and it gets good reviews. And you keep saying, well, what will our opening week box office target be? Do we need to dial up or change our marketing? Now, at what point along that timeline should you and could you be doing that? If you knew from some test audiences or some buzz on Twitter that there was something that wasn't quite right, you could probably dial up or dial, dial down your marketing. But once you've reached that opening week, you can't go backwards anymore. Um, Nielsen said that uh, tweets drive higher broadcast uh, for 48% of shows. Uh, go recent Google study <coughs> said that 70% of the variation in box office can be explained with movie-related search volumes. So you've got all these digital elements here that are starting to impact traditional movie marketing. Yes, good point. In fact, smart movie makers actually allow bloggers on set and they actually want them to leak things that are going on because how you become an influencer is you have access to something that no one else has. So if you can go on a closed set and, okay, maybe you work with the, the film studio and you get approval, you're not going to you know, completely give away the plot line. If I was doing that and I was blogging about it, my blog traffic would go through the roof because Andrew Grill's got access to the new James Bond 79 or whatever it is. Um, and that's how it works. And so you have an influencer strategy where you don't control them, but they love your product or brand or movie or the franchise, and they want to help you. And they're not paid. Their payment is getting access that you no longer get. That's where influencer marketing comes into its own. Co-creation, what about we say, we're going to make a movie, what should we make, and let's fund it. And then you actually get the script written by the people who are going to go and watch it. That would be, I think, where we're probably heading to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So right now we're actually talking about marketing before we've actually made the thing, before the first film is turned over, we've got it. Everyone remember Bruno? Everyone saw it? Didn't do too well. And what happened was that people coming out of the movie theatre saying, Bruno sucked, incredibly disappointed, no Bruno. That, you know, people will argue that the movie actually tanked because of Twitter. And maybe they left it too late. Maybe they didn't actually look at the pre-buzz 
and they were banking on the fact that Borat was, was funny and Ali G and all that sort of stuff. Oh, they'll love, I'll love this. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I think they were really impacted by some negative reviews because back to that purchase decision, if everyone else that I respect is saying that this is not a good product, am I going to go and spend 13, 14 pounds on that product? No, I'll wait till it comes out on, on DVD or it's on Sky. So what we did is actually, here's some of the, 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 the practice here. We actually engaged the major, major movie studio and we looked at building a box office prediction model based on online audience behaviours. So this is where some of the sceptics would go, oh, this is just rubbish. Let me step up a bit. So I generally, in my old job, would go into market research firms. One of them was a market research firm of a large uh, retailer in the UK. And the first meeting was like this. What do you know about research? You're going to help us with social. I've got to tell you, three weeks later, when we signed the contract, it was a kiss and a hug. Because those three market researchers became six. Not because they hired more people. The insight that we were giving them through social was actually the same as three more people. What they would do is actually go and survey every month all of their stores. They'd survey 30 people from all their stores, get it together, and then four to five weeks after that, they'd get the, the information back. But social was giving them a three-day heads up. They were getting a heads up as to what was going on. So they were seeing that in terms of market research, it can augment. It should not replace. It can augment and give you some early warning as well. So what we did here is we looked at you know, movie characteristics, number of theatres, movie size, genre, studio, seasonability, rating, the online presence, things like Twitter volume and sentiment, Facebook likes, all the sort of signals you have access to. Because the challenge with digital um, research is you've got to have some signals you can actually capture. What we then did is train models based on data from about 200 different movies and did some predictive analysis. And then we looked at the week eight, week four, and week one models. Now, I'm going to race through this because there's a lot of lovely data here, but I just want to show you that there was some real science behind this. What we found, though, that were the relationships between the social signals and box office sales. So Twitter volume and negative sentiment seem to have a strong correlation with actual weekend box office results. That's interesting. So I'm not saying Twitter is a genius, but it is an indication. Now, some people said you can gain things. And some of the other days said, well, if you've got lots of people just doing frivolous tweets, actually, that's still a signal. Someone bothers to do something and tweet something, good or bad, at least it's a signal that you can measure. So what we found is that we had a high level of model fit for the accuracy based on up to eight weeks. And in fact, I'll show you in a minute, we actually out-predicted all the other excellent pred predictive models from uh, newspapers and those sort of things. So we had a look at our weight, uh, week eight models, where we looked at a relative significance. We looked at week four and week one. And then what we did, this is where we came into our own. We, the green is where it was the most accurate prediction for a number of different movies. We've got Fast and Furious, After Earth, Now You See Me, Monsters University. We're looking at a major US studio predictions, boxoffice.com, LA Times, and what the IBM predictive LA analytics were. I think that's probably a 70 to 80% hit rate. So using data, we could start to predict what these box offices would do. So you then go backwards, knowing all this and having hundreds of movies you've analysed, and you go, there's a trend there. We should have got the bloggers in earlier. We should have actually screened the test thing at the first scene and actually worked out whether they were going to enjoy that. We found for different genres that it changes. So for action animated films, it's the easiest to predict. And you can see the genre by prediction error. We found that fall and summer release films are more accurately predicted compared to other seasons, which is interesting in itself. Seasonality comes into it. Large and extra large films are very accurately predicted, probably because there's lots of volume around it and people talk about it. There are lots of signals. Uh, harder to predict small and medium-sized movies. And it is an iterative process. So when we did all this, we thought, OK, what else can we throw into the mix? So we went to our friends at YouTube and thought, well, let's actually look at YouTube trailer data and see how many people are watching the trailers, which is an indication that you know, the movie is worth going to see. I know, like you, before I go to a hotel, I look at TripAdvisor. Before I go and look at a movie, my daughter says, Daddy, can we look at the trailer? Because we've got to go and see it. Um, what we saw then, that the accuracy was improved by up to 13% by adding this trailer data to that as well. So more and more signals coming in. Because you can't go and ask everyone, you know, are you going to go and see the movie? But if you're watching the trailer, you don't stumble across these things. You probably have some correlation that you're going to watch it. Interestingly also, the intent to watch extracted from social buzz didn't equate to positive sentiment. What we saw here was that over time, um, the trend of intent to watch is not the same as the trend of positive sentiment. So you can see some correlations there as well. And sentiment is really hard to do, trust me. Having worked in this space for five or seven years, sentiment is really hard. In terms of geography, this is another area where it can come into its own. When you've got a big market like the US and you're opening up thousands of cinemas, we could see for different films there were different reactions in terms of volumes. And so again, you can start moving your marketing budget around. 
when maybe you thought it's going to be a big opening weekend in the East Coast, wow, West Coast is really picking up. We should put some more budget there as well. So there are, there are things you can do with this data to actually tweak your marketing campaign. Um, and looking here at the negative sentiment versus uh, changing number of theatres, we saw, for example, if it's almost like a formula. If a new film game is 1,000 less negative sentiment posts than a similar film one week before release, it's likely to bring in more than a million dollars more at opening weekend. That's interesting. Conversely, if a new film is shown in 500 more theatres than a cinema similar film, that film is likely to bring in a million more opening weekend. So again, I think having these levers, if I'm a marketing, a movie marketing person, having these levers are going to be very important and being able to change dynamically uh, when you're in that sort of uh, eight-week process I think is also very important. So I'll stop there. Um, what I hope you've understood is that you know, social and online data can be very useful in predictive analytics, that social is really important and you should be involved in it, and I'd be happy to take any questions.